Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It is Tuesday, the 20th day of October 2020. That's a lot of 20s. Got a few things to talk about going on in the tropics. Of course, we have Tropical Storm Epsilon out there well to the east-southeast of Bermuda. Probably not going to pose much of a threat of any major impacts for Bermuda or elsewhere for that matter, but it's worth talking about, so let's just take a look at what we've got, shall we? Uh, for whatever reason, I cannot get the GIF animations to work on Tropical Tidbits. It's just not working for me. I don't know if anybody else is having that problem, but I certainly am. It just doesn't seem to do it. So we're going to use the weathernerds.org, and we've got this nice satellite animation. This is the infrared, and as you hopefully know, the brighter the colors um, typically, well, in this case, actually the oranges and the blacks and grays, and then eventually the whites and purples in here, uh, the temperature scale in this situation, it gets colder the further down the scale you go. I know that sounds weird, but it's colder this way and warmer this way. So this is warm ocean water, for example, and these are cold cloud tops, as indicated by these colors through here. And some of those cloud tops reaching minus 60, minus 70 Celsius, meaning that they are reaching way up into the atmosphere, deep convection associated with the tropical storm out here, Epsilon. Um, just this long fetch of moisture streaming up out of the Caribbean. No hurricanes, no tropical storms there, even though the GFS was trolling us all by indicating that something would develop this week. It doesn't look like it will, and I'll show you a little bit of the reason why that's not going to happen. And elsewhere, a few areas to watch a piece of energy out here, but there are strong upper level winds cutting across this way. Then we have another piece of energy over this, uh, a little farther to the east, south of the uh, Cape Verde Islands, Cabo Verde Islands, whatever. Are we just going to have two names for everything? I guess we will. <laughs> anyway, um, strong wind shear there as well. Just not a lot of activity in terms of major threats to land areas, which we would expect this time of year. Look at that frontal boundary. You can see that boundary in there, and then this sort of arm that feeds in to Epsilon, and then some more. I'll show you this on the vorticity in just a moment. It's interesting how it's all connected. Uh, but, you know, fairly busy. I think Epsilon's going to become a hurricane, so that'll give us the 10th name hurricane, or hurricane of the season, named hurricane, whatever. A um, lot of lightning with it. You can see all those yellow speckles in there. Now, what Epsilon is trying to do, the storm system, remember, it's not a living thing. It's a process in the atmosphere. There's a lot of thermodynamics involved, fluid dynamics in the atmosphere, latent heat release, etc. It's trying to develop sort of its own core here and break off from all the rest of this nonsense going on with it. And I think it'll eventually do so. And you can already see the beginnings of that with what are we refer to as this central dense overcast right in here. And then there's an eye starting to, to develop in the middle. And even a little bit of lightning right around the core there, right around the eye. So this is well on its way to becoming the 10th hurricane of the Atlantic season. There seems to be some fairly well-established outflow up here on the northern side. And the water temperatures all through this region are fairly warm. 26, 27 Celsius or so, decent upper ocean heat content, no hurricanes plowing through this area within the last several weeks, not since Paulette and Teddy. So there are no real significant cold wakes left behind. The thermodynamics are all there. Bottom line, I think this will become a hurricane. Now what it will do, it will generate these swells. I talk about this a lot because it's important to understand the impacts. So the hurricane will generate these swells that will radiate outward. I'm just trying to help illustrate it here. From the center, eventually reaching thousands of miles away. So the shores of Bermuda, yep, you will receive swells from this. Farther to the south and southwest, down in the Virgin Islands, you guys will get some swells from this. And those swells will propagate all the way out, eventually reaching the east coast and the southeast coast. So Hatteras, you go down to Hatteras Island, Rodanthe, that area, probably see some pretty good swells coming in. Might be, might be, <laughs> might and maybe mixed together. Might be, 
Um, <laughs> it's fine. I love it when I mess up sometimes. We're all human. Uh, you might have some good swells coming in there, which may lead to, or might be, uh, to some overwash out on Highway 12. Uh, just something to keep in mind if you're going to be visiting that area. Once we get some more information here, and especially as this becomes a hurricane, and I think it's going to be a fairly potent hurricane, uh, probably going to top out, I'm going to guess this gets to 120. All right, put me down for 120 miles per hour. I just, they do that in the subtropics when you least expect it. And I'm not even joking. I'm not just being silly. 120 miles per hour. I bet this gets to 120. And yes, that will send out some pretty decent swells. And uh, those vulnerable areas of Highway 12 along the North Carolina Outer Banks, look out. You might see some overwash in the coming days, and we can watch that unfold on our permanent camera that we have out there in Rodanthe. Otherwise, everything's looking pretty good. We did seem to avoid the model-indicated hurricane that the GFS was insisting. Run after run after run was going to happen. I don't think it's going to, at least not yet. It's not over. It's still time on the clock, as they say. Uh, but there is a fairly decent area of low-level vorticity or energy and spin in the atmosphere. There's a, there's a spark down there, but the fan blowing across the top of that spark is just a little too strong right now. I'm going to show you in a minute. There's really strong westerly winds cutting across this way. And there's dry air down there as well. That gets injected to it. And it's just not in a favorable overall environment. Here's the frontal boundary and just the overall strung out vorticity with our tropical storm kind of latched on. And once this breaks away and fully detaches itself, I really do think this will make it to Category 3 at 120 miles per hour. That's what I think will happen. Seriously. So mark me down. All right. So uh, let's take a look at a couple things. This is the initial. Well, this is six hours out. So this is basically valid about an hour and 17 minutes ago eastern time plus six which is 18 z zulu time tuesday that's today and the time right now is 3 18 p.m eastern 18 z would have been 2 p.m so it's about an hour and 18 minutes out of date but the general idea is this check out our area of vorticity and counterclockwise rotation you can see the little wind barbs and the wind flags through here so there, does, there, there is some spin. There's a seedling there. And then we have our frontal area and then the, the tropical cyclone here kind of embedded in there. And then really nothing else out there. Not much energy. Just some strung out vorticity down here in the Caribbean. But keep your eyes on this. I'll circle it for you. Oh, also note the sprawling area of high pressure that is over the western Atlantic here. You can see these various and sundry height lines. Uh, and it's in the 80s again because of that in the southeast part of North Carolina as an example. Very warm conditions here in the east with strong high pressure in control over the western Atlantic. And had anything developed down here, it would have been stuck for a while before a trough comes in over here to kind of kick it out. That part of the pattern was there. But if we go and let me circle this back again, keep your eyes on this area. Now let's look at it at the 200 millibar. Of course, I circled it in a color that's hard to see through. So let's use violet. If we go up to the 850 to 200, 200 millibar level, sort of this zone of the atmosphere, if this is 850 millibars, which is 5,000 feet, and this is 200 millibars, which is about, what is it, 30 or 40,000 feet, you're talking about the wind shear between these two zones, 5,000 feet to around 30,000 feet, roughly. And in this case, those winds are blowing really strong from the west. And that's what all of that uh, orange uh, and red color is blasting through here. These different streamlines that you see. And then the color code that Levi has set up, 45 to 50 knots. So you've got that system down there spinning around trying to convect. And then the winds are blowing across the top of it very fast. It's a no-go. So, you know, it's like, all right, sorry, it's a no-go for you. Uh, the anticyclone, where there's not that much wind shear, is farther to the south, down over the southwest Caribbean. But there's no spark down there to speak of. Just a little bit of energy, but nothing coming together. So, and, you know, the GFS got it wrong when it was showing that hurricane uh, for, you know, the next several days to the end of the month that we were all watching. It's not, doesn't look like it's going to happen. 
So be thankful. I'm sure everybody is. We've had enough this year. So let's move this out 24 hours. So this is valid tomorrow morning. And again, there is a disturbance there. No question about it. And that will bring some inclement weather. But there's not much to it. Meanwhile, watch what happens with Epsilon over here. It'll eventually sort of detach itself and become its own true, you know, standalone, make a name for itself uh, hurricane. I really believe that and probably a strong one uh, over the coming days. So this is 36, finally 48 hours. And there Epsilon goes. And at this point here, by about 60 to 72 hours, it looks like a fairly decent hurricane in the model. Still might have some of these appendages that resemble a little bit of a frontal structure. Um, not your classic hurricane. It did not originate from a tropical wave, and then it's just up here in the subtropics. It formed from a mid-latitude system that worked its way down to the surface. Nevertheless, it's over warm enough water. It, it's going to be a hurricane. Trust me on that. I'm 99% sure, and I think it's going to become, like I said, at least 120 mile per hour hurricane. So that's three days out. It's well to the east of Bermuda, maybe some breezy conditions around there, sure, uh, but that's about it. And uh, it moves on off slowly and definitely seems to ramp up there over the Atlantic uh, at about day four or five around there. Uh, and then it scoots on out probably will add 10 or 12 ace points, maybe something like that, uh, if you're keeping track of that. And then the GFS trying to troll us again at day five. What in the world is this? A little piece of energy trying to come together east of Honduras and Nicaragua. You know, we might as well just look and see what happens to it at day six. There's 144. Finally, day seven at 168. Yeah. We'll see. We'll keep an eye on it. That's what we're here for. Uh, there's a trough coming in, cold front, and then the big Atlantic Ridge of high pressure sitting out here. So anything that does develop will stay buried. That's the pattern, and that's what you look for. First and foremost, what is the pattern? You know, it's kind of like saying, do we even have a good team at all? If you're baseball, football, basketball, whatever. You know, do we even have a good team? When you start thinking about, hey, we could be champions this year. We could be conference champions. We might win the regional championship. We might be national champions. Maybe your NFL team is going to win the Super Bowl. Well, do you even have a good team to start with? That's the pattern. That's what we look at. And so forget the other stuff. If the pattern's not there, you're not going to get development. And if you do get development, you have to figure out what's going to happen with it. And the pattern is a big guidepost. It really is. It helps you to understand if there is something. So let's just pretend that was a hurricane. It's going to stay buried over Central America. Now that's bad for them, certainly. But there's nothing that would indicate that if there was even a hurricane down in this region, that it could make it up into Florida. It can't. Why? Because of all this high pressure sitting up here. A very stout, thick area of high pressure, which for me and everybody else, too, that southeasterly flow turns to the southwest. Oh, yeah. All the way through the 27th, a week out, nothing but warm in the southeast. Yes, I love it. My kind of weather. All right. Um, wow. Hadn't looked at this in a while. Uh, and we're going to look at it more and more, especially in the off season, which is coming at the end of November. November 30th is the final day of hurricane season, at least on the calendar. So we got the La Nina over here, and this is strengthening. And I'm going to show you some information from the Climate Prediction Center in just a moment. Meanwhile, boy, the Atlantic Basin still, especially the main development region. I tell you what, on Monday, we'll take a look at the broader picture of all of this and gauge what the anomalies are, uh, especially in the Atlantic. Look at that little stripe right there of the Gulf Stream kind of standing out as a very strong signal positive anomaly. Also of note, let's zoom in to the Gulf. All of that activity from Sally and Laura and Marco and Gamma and Delta, yeah, well, there's just a little patch of below normal. Everything else warmed right back up. Not saying that that'll be a problem for the rest of the season. It's just that's how fast things can change. And there is just a little bit of leftover cold weight from Paulette and Teddy, but not enough, more than likely, to thwart 
Epsilon. And you know what? Here we go. I'm going to root for Epsilon to just get as strong as it wants to get because it's going to stay away from Bermuda. And ships can avoid it. That's all up to the captain and the shipping industry that's controlling you know, the, the company. But seriously, if they're out over the open Atlantic, let them become 200 miles per, per hour for all I care. I mean, I know they generate giant waves and those can have consequences, but um, you know, for Epsilon, go for it. You know what I mean? Let's see how strong it can get. Maybe boost those ace points a little bit uh, for the season. Look at that little doodad right there. I just noticed it. That little curly hue. Isn't that neat? Some kind of transverse um, banding deal going on with the ocean currents down there. Fascinating stuff. These high resolution, uh, and this is not even the highest resolution, you know, satellite picture. It, this is satellite derived, by the way. Um, at least I think it is. Maybe it's not. I have to look into that. How do we get these? I mean, it's a map, and I know it's a combination of buoys and satellite data. Anyway, just kind of neat. I get distracted. That's cool. Wow, that's really neat. We'll, we'll look and zoom in on that on Monday. Uh, this is what I wanted to show you as I wrap things up. The El Nino Enso phenomenon, as we call it, E-N-S-O, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, well, we're in La Nina. That is, that's the state that we're in. The state of the Enso, we're in La Nina. All the indices, Nino 4, which is out here, you know, leaning towards the West Pack. There's the date line right there. Um, Nino 3.4, which takes into account portions of 3 and 4. It's kind of like a Venn diagram. What a convenient chart. Whoever made this, thank you. It really helps me to illustrate what's what. The Nino 3 area, the Nino 1, 2, which is right off South America. All of these indices are negative. So we are firmly in the La Nina threshold and the Nino 3.4, which seems to be, and that's this region right here, See, there's North America, there's South America, way out in the Central Pacific. The Nino 3-4 is generally what people like Phil Klotzbach and his colleagues look at for hurricane season impacts. And, I mean, negative 1.4, the threshold is typically half a degree. So we're a full degree below uh, where we typically would expect La Nina conditions to begin. There's the separated graph right there. Off the cliff it went. And the interesting thing about this, and we'll get into this more in um, December and beyond, is that it's very rare to get an El Nino immediately following a La Nina, especially a strong La Nina. And we're not necessarily strong yet. I think you had to be like 2 Celsius or stronger, below nat normal, below, below, below average, to be considered a strong La Nina. You have to brush up on that. But uh, we're headed towards a moderate La Nina, and the, uh, the, the general idea, dry, warm, overall weather for most of the um, lower 48, maybe the northern tier states a little colder, a little stormier, but you know, dry in the west, the drought conditions will persist. And we've got to start watching Florida. Their dry season is going to come on strong, and typically in a La Nina, you get really dry in Florida, so by February and March, I fully expect that we're going to have a wildfire problem in Florida, something to keep in mind for later. And then, of course, we'll track the INSO phenomenon and see how that might affect the hurricane season in 2021. But that's a long way away. We have plenty of other stuff to deal with before then. But it's cool that we can track this kind of stuff on a daily, weekly, and even monthly basis. I hope that you agree. All right, well, thanks for tuning in, as always. At least I got through this one without any errors. Yesterday, I screwed something up at the very end of yesterday's video for like the last couple of minutes and it was difficult to edit it out so I just chopped off the end, faded to this title card for yesterday's date and that was the end of it. Uh, this one seems to have gone much better. So thanks for tuning in, I do appreciate it. Don't forget we are crowdfunded through Patreon and if you're interested in joining that movement, it's not too late. It's not just during hurricane season. Oh no, there's plenty of off-season stuff and never too late to become a part of this crowdfunded movement that has enabled us to do so much. Patreon.com slash Hurricane Track. And a big thank you to everyone who has supported this, not only this year, but the last several, and even going back 15 years when we began the whole live streaming concept. Uh, yeah, we, did, we started it in 2005. Probably one of the first in the world. 
But who's keeping track of that, right? Anyway, I appreciate anybody tuning in. It's great to have you on your side of the screen. I am Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. We will reconvene for more tomorrow.